Welcome to lecture seven in our series on prosody. And in this lecture, we'll focus on phonation types, um, also referred to as voice quality, and including things like breathy and creaky voice. In terms of background, if you're not familiar with figures like the ones shown on this slide, I would recommend that you go back and listen to lectures four and five before proceeding with this content. So before we focus on phonation types, let's start off with a brief exercise. So let's listen to a recording, and you should try to write down what you hear in terms of prosody. Ina. So what do you hear? How would you characterize this utterance prosodically? Now, you might complain that it's hard to do that when there's no context to know, for example, if this is high or low in a speaker's range. So here's a little context. And the original recording again. So write those down. We'll come back to it at the end of this lecture. Um, and I also do want to note that this is a recording from a language that may, you may not be familiar with, and that's by intent. It can often be good to learn to focus on the percept of the sound as it an object in itself, um, rather than being distracted by the speaker's meaning or intent or attitudes. And that can be easier when it's not in your native tongue. So we're going to be focusing on voice quality and phonation types here. And this, a few years ago, might not have been a major topic of a prosody lecture, but it these features are important. They're used heavily in things like dialogue and in other aspects of linguistic production. And they also are often correlated with the other features of prosody that we've talked about in previous lectures. And so it's important to understand how they behave and how they're used. So we're going to start off with creaky voice. Um, it's usually produced because of a combination of low airflow and possibly slack vocal folds and it can be produced with a whole bunch of different uh, settings of the various muscles and ligaments in the larynx providing slightly different variations of creaky voice. So one way you can produce creaky voice is by getting low airflow by talking for a long, long, long time and running out of air. So another way that you can frequently produce creaky voice is by pushing yourself toward the low end of your pitch range. So sing or say the lowest sound you can and then try to go a bit lower as in this example. And you can hear the voice get very creaky at the end. You can try that yourself. So it can be difficult to sometimes be sure that you're hearing creaky voice just from the audio. And so you might want to look at the acoustics as well. Um, here we have modal voice, which is sort of the default not natural way of speaking where your vocal folds are vibrating regularly and we can see even though we have a complex waveform that the glottal pulses here marked by these blue arrows um, are very similarly spaced and very regular. In contrast, if we look below at the creaky voice example, it's hard to find the, cre the glottal pulses. The arrows have very varying separations and that's a result of the irregular um, opening and closings of the vocal folds. Instead of being half open half the time, closed half the time, they're closed more than half the time. The even separation is characteristic of modal voice. And people, the term creaky voice comes from the same sort of thing as the creak of a door, where instead of moving smoothly, it's sticking and slipping, producing that weird noise. Creaky voice is sometimes referred to as a vocal fry, um, referring to similar sort of popping sounds that you get when um, oil and water interact when you're cooking. 
So here's another creaky voice example. We can also, if it's hard to see creaky voice in the waveform itself, we can use derived measures like pitch. And here we have a pitch track for that creaky utterance. So we're just going to look at the blue pitch track here, and you'll see some of these really big dives where the pitch track demonstrates octaving errors or octave jumps where we can't possibly be moving our articulators or changing the configurators, configuration of our articulators enough, quickly enough, to get those sorts of changes. So these are typically problems with pitch tracking due to the irregular creaky voicing. And even if we ignore those, if we go in and focus on the pitch track the remainder of the pitch track, we don't see the same sort of smooth pitch track that we would expect to see. Here again, we're seeing all of these little jitters um, that are a result of the irregular voicing in creaky voice. And these can be used sort of as diagnostics for creaky voice. So we've seen their articulatory correlates and these additional acoustic correlates as well. Now it's worth noting that creaky voice is an individual characteristic, so it can be affected by aging as vocal folds thicken and um, move less regularly. Smoking can also affect the vocal cords such that uh, creaky voice becomes more prevalent, but in general, people can manipulate the amount of creak um, in their speech to various effects. Now moving on to breathy voice in in this case, if we look at the vocal folds in this image, the light bits, we can see that even though they're trying to be closed, they're not fully closed. And those in incomplete glottal closures yield breathy voice and its acoustic correlates in that air continues to flow through the vocal folds even when they should be closed and yields low harmonicity. Now we can listen to an example from some gameplay where someone makes a, one participant makes a suggestion and their partner tries to break in uh, with urgency, um, which is often associated with breathy voice in this example. Right here, let's, uh, let's do this together. Okay. One, jump, jump, jump! So you can hear the breathiness in the jump, 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 and also in the laughter after which you, word, which is often quite breathy. Now, this might seem to have some similarities with the types of breathiness that are in whispered speech, but this is a different mechanism. Uh, breathy voice results from incomplete closures of the vocal folds, whereas when you're whispering like this, the vocal folds are spread, held apart. Now, to better understand what's happening in breathy voice, as contrasted with modal voice, we're going to use a different visualization. Here we have a spectrogram with time on the x-axis and frequency on the y-axis, and the darkness of the line indicates the amount of energy in that frequency. And we can see the fundamental frequency at the bottom, and like in musical instruments, like flutes or pianos, there are associated overtones or harmonics, which are multiples of that fundamental frequency. And we can see that in those lines here. Um, modal voice has this clear harmonic structure. And if we look at a slice, we can see the regular multiples of that fundamental frequency. And if this were breathy, that would be significantly obscured by the passage of air through the vocal tract and through that incomplete closure. Now, we can actually produce voicing that is even more harmonic or highly harmonic than in the modal case. In that case, that's produced with a lowered larynx and a widened pharynx and is a bit more like more musical, more like a singing voice. Uh, as in an example like you who where you're calling and producing a more harmonic sound. The last uh, form of phonation that we'll look at is falsetto. 
and in this case it's characterized by stretched vocal folds which yield a very high pitch in speech and we have an example here from a naturally occurring conversation where one participant is trying to persuade her friend to stay in a particular class called interval to stay in interval and for contrast we have her speech in her normal register you can't get a waiver to try and get him perhaps with a little bit of creak and that's a big contrast between the falsetto speech and their typical register so much so that they almost don't sound like the same person and here's the full context just stay in interval but i like human computer interactions like the interfaces and stuff like that i like that you can't get a waiver to try and get him and here they're using that sort of falsetto setting to convey uh, sincerity and other pragmatic characteristics. So in, to sum up, we have seen a variety of phonation types, and some of them we can organize kind of on a continuum of periodicity relating to the regular opening and closing of vocal folds, but it is more complicated than that in that a number of these phenomena don't fit as neatly onto that sort of continuum. Uh, phonation and voice quality are a complex ensemble of phenomena. So returning to our earlier example, let's go back and listen briefly. Ina. So what do you hear now that we've talked about phonation type? You should hear a few things. You should hear creak. It's definitely creaky, maybe some nasalization, and also that this is um, a bit higher in the speaker's pitch range. And it's worth noting that while uh, creak often occurs on low pitch, it doesn't have to, so it can occur on higher pitched utterances as well. Uh, these are two different aspects of speech processing. So we've now seen this last of the several types of prosodic features that we've covered, and there are actually many more features which are derived from these basic features and serve to characterize broader spans of speech, for example, through maxima or minima, and we'll cover those in later lectures. But hopefully we've convinced you that prosody is more than intonation and to use a bit of a cliche um, F0 is just the tip of the prosodic iceberg with many features contributing to prosodic structure. So we've covered a range of features and in the next lecture we'll give you a chance to sharpen your skills in terms of production and perception of speech prosody.